Hello, everyone, and welcome to week four. There we go. Welcome to week four, Constructions of Blackness. Our reading for uh, this week consists of the essay by Patricia Hill Collins, The Passes of Our Present, which you should be able to find on our Canvas page. And you also need to watch the Ethnic Notions film, which should be about an hour, a little bit less than an hour for you to watch. Now, the article uh, by Patricia Hill Collins begins talking about um, new racism. And part of what we're discussing, um, starting with this week, are how stereotypical images about African Americans have been constructed historically in the United States, particularly through the media. In the Ethnic Notions film, uh, you'll see a number of images about African Americans created from the time of slavery, and how these images constructed certain expectations of African Americans in US society. In the reading, Hill Collins also discusses several of these images, connecting these to different periods of history and how they continue to have an impact today. She begins by talking about the three elements of uh, new racism. Uh, a racism that isn't as overt as slavery or segregation, or segregation, but that continues to function globally. And there are these three elements that she talks about, so globalization, transnationalism, and hegemonic ideologies found within media. The concentration of wealth in the hands of a few in a global economy results in the ongoing racialization of poverty globally. And this is the globalization aspect of this new racism she's talking about. Racial inequality is now transnational and that is not solely controlled by one nation or local government. And hegemonic ideas about racial difference perpetuated by the media continue to exist and travel globally. And she begins talking about the various images that are constructed during slavery uh, times. Uh, beginning with uh, some of the controlling images created under slavery for Black women, being the mules, the Jezebel, and the reader. In order to control slaves, certain controlling images were created in order to justify their exploitation. Hill Collins argues that while both Black women and men were exploited through slavery, there were gender differences in the images that were created to control each one. For women, the image of women uh, as mules justified working Black women as if they were animals. Uh, the institutionalization of rape by their masters constructed the Black women's sexuality as wild and untamed. She therefore is responsible for her own rape, for being the temptress of white men. And finally, the image of the breeder encouraged Black women to have many children that brought more wealth to the masters. As the reading states, quote, sexuality and fertility were neither designed for black women's pleasure, not subject to their control. The system was designed to stamp out agency and annex black women's bodies to a system of profit. For black men, uh, the images created was of the, of the quote unquote buck, uh, the images of, of the Black men as being inherently violent, intellectually inferior, and sexually wild. And so Black men were perceived to be wild savages who are prone to violence, and the only way to domesticate them is to turn them into a good worker through the process of slavery. And you see here in this image, uh, this is a, a advertisement, basically, on the newspaper of a sale of slaves. And you see the term bucks being used here to describe the males that were uh, for sale at, 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 and for this particular, um, from this particular plantation. The images of Uncle Tom and Mammy were cre per created particularly for those that worked within the households of the masters in order to justify these slaves being allowed proximity 
within the house. They needed to create an Im image of them as docile, subservient, loyal, and happy to serve. Though these images of house servants were excluded from the images that post them as a threat to whites. Um, so in other words, these images were created in contrast to those previous images um, discussed as a way to demonstrate that these particular um, servants were okay to have within the house because they didn't fit the, the wild, savage, violent, um, uncontrollable types of images of the field slaves. These were different. These were docile, these were subservient, these were loyal. And so they didn't pose a threat to their white masters. So it was quote unquote safe to have them in the house. And we also saw uh, significant examples of these images in the film Ethnic Notions and how these images appeared in songs, children's books, and eventually Hollywood movies. And this is an image of um, Gone with the Wind, of the movie Gone with the Wind. Um, and the actress here playing the role of the Mammy actually won an Oscar for her performance here. But that was one of the limitations for many um, actors and actresses during this earlier time period that these were the only kinds of roles that they could play and that were deemed uh, reward worthy. Okay? But also to think about, you know, how a film like Gone with the Wind, which is so famous and such a part of our American culture, perpetuated these images of the beautiful white woman um, and the black mammy that serves her. The author also talked about the relationship between slavery and masculinity. Uh, by defining black slaves as others, white men constructed their masculinity in relation to the other. White masculinity under slavery required white men to be the patriarchs in control of the family, meaning women and children, and also having wealth and being able to control that wealth, meaning land and slaves. In order to uphold this masculinity, violence was required, not just violence towards their slaves, but sometimes violence um, within their families as well, to sort of keep everyone in check, keep everyone within their assigned and expected role. Because of how white masculinity was defined, black men were not afforded the ability to have the same masculinity as white men. Their masculinity was defined through sexual prowess and brute strength. They were not allowed uh, control over their own family or their work. Um, and we'll see as, as discussed in the reading, even after uh, slavery ends. And this image here of the Vogue magazine represents right this image of the black man as all as almost beastly, right? And the uh, beautiful white woman um, that he's a threat to and that should be saved from him. And I believe this image was from 2008. The emancipation of slaves did not result in the end of these controlling images. New methods and images were created in order to continue to control African-Americans and ensure they continue to serve as a source of cheap labor. The Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson legalized segregation, which functioned as, a, as another system of control, keeping African-Americans confined to certain spaces and jobs. Segregation resulted in limited economic op opportunities for most African-Americans. Many remained in agricultural work, particularly in the South, whether through sharecropping their own land or on land owned by whites. Lynching and rape, became new forms of controlling African-Americans, particularly those that were perceived as straying from the social divisions regulated by segregation. And these, uh, uh, the ongoing idea of black men as hypersexual now made them a threat to the beautiful white women whom they couldn't help but desire. This added another element to white masculinity as protectors of white women's virtues. Media, media helped perpetuate the ideas of the violent black male rapist through films like Birth of a Nation, which the author discusses and we also see discussed within the film Ethnic Notions. 
Black urbanization expanded as more African-Americans left the South in search of better conditions and economic opportunities. There were certain pros and cons though to this move from the South to uh, the North or to other cities in the country. In terms of negative uh, aspects, they still continue to experience racial disadvantages, racial disadvantages such as segregation, uh, low wage jobs, domestic work uh, for black women and overcrowded unhealthy neighborhoods. Uh, however, there were some positives to their urbanization, including the opportunity to create organizations such as the NAACP and the United Negro Improvement Association. Urban, urbanization also allowed for the migration, organization, and visibility of African-American LGBTQ people, Black workers, and single Black women. However, single Black women came under the scrutiny of fellow Black middle-class women who promoted respectability as a way of contrasting images of the Jezebel. The politics of respectability was characterized by cleanliness of person and property, temperance, thrift, polite manners, and sexual purity. So the politics of respectability for Black women was really a way to uh, gain white approval. Black middle class women saw it their duty to bring working class Black women into the folds of the church and away from the popular dance halls of the era that represented the dangers of the street. But working class women saw this as an opportunity to have some agency finally over their sexuality. As you recall, when we talked about uh, slavery, black women had no control whatsoever over their bodies or their sexuality. And so this was seen as an opportunity where they could finally have some freedom in that regard um, and have some control. The reading in particular talks about the rise of blues music where Black female singers gave voice to a positive Black female sexuality grounded in sensuality and desire. The politics of respectability also had an impact on Black men, putting pressures on them to live up to the ideals of white masculinity, of having a particular type of job where they earn a particular kind of money, um, where they were able to provide a certain kind of lifestyle for the Black family. While the civil rights era ushered in a period of hopefulness that future generations would have better opportunities and experiences, the author demonstrates that this has not turned out to be the case. Ongoing poverty and segregation limits opportunities for upward mobility for many African-American youth in particular. The rise in mass incarceration has resulted in large numbers of Black men in prisons, which adds to the ongoing inability of Black men to be able to achieve those mainstream standards of uh, being able to provide for, the, for um, their families. This in consequence uh, results in an increase in single uh, motherhood among the black community. These conditions resulted in distinctions being made among black working class families between decent versus street families where decent was used to describe vulnerable working class families and street was used to describe working class families that were already in crisis. In other words, you know, uh, families where there were already people working in the underground um, drug economy and so on. And this quote captures what the uh, author has been trying to um, point out throughout her article. And the quote reads, no nation can enslave a race of people for hundreds of years set them free, bedraggled and penniless, pit them without assistance in a hostile environment against privileged victimizers, and then reasonably expect the gap between the heirs of the two groups to narrow. Lines begun parallel and left alone can never touch. And in essence, what the quote is talking about is this long history that you see being discussed throughout the article of hundreds of years of slavery, uh, emancipation that really didn't provide um, freedom for African Americans and kept them in um, situations of poverty and, and segregation and limited opportunities, uh, all the way up to um, today with mass incarceration and so on. Um, and to um, suggest or make the argument that after so many years of those kinds of experiences, 
we can't expect that all of a sudden African Americans are going to be in equal uh, status or playing fields or opportunities as the uh, dominant white population, right? That has had all these advantages from the beginning, right? So this uh, quote really sort of encapsulates, right, what uh, the author's um, point has been in, in writing this piece where she is demonstrating from slavery times to the present um, over time, um, not just what the conditions of African-Americans have been in this country, but how the images attached to those different periods has an impact and continue to exist to today. So there and uh, therein ends our lecture for this week. Um, I will post uh, the slides separately below this video on Canvas, so you can also have the slides um, uh, available to you. Um, and I will see you next week.